So the last class, we ran out of time talking about uh, B plus trees. So I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about the things we missed uh, real quickly, some of the optimizations, some, some of the other design choices we have in the system uh, in, in our data structure. And then we'll jump over to talk about how to do a multi-threaded uh, B plus tree, uh, which again, you'll need for the second project. All right, so there's a bunch of other design decisions we have to make, not just like, you know, do I take from the left, take from the right, all these different things. But there's the actual, like, the implementation itself. There's different policies we could have for how we organize data, maybe when do we split, when do we merge, and so forth. Um, so I'm just going to go over it, sort of some of the, the quick four main things that we need to think about. But there's this great book here called Modern B, B Tree Techniques by Gertz Graffi. Uh, this came out, I think, 2010. Uh, this is basically was the Bible of B plus trees, everything you'd ever want to know. Um, if you just Google the name of P, the, for PDF, it'll show up on Google, or the, the, the senior library has it. So some of the stuff we'll talk about here comes from uh, uh, this book here. All right, so the, the one thing we got to consider is like, what's our node size going to be? Um, so I've already said when we talked about buffer pools, we said that in the enterprise systems, you can actually specify what do you want the page size to be for different components in the system? Right? You could have for, uh, for, 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 for certain tables, have a certain page size, and then even within the data structure themselves, the hash tables or the B plus tree indexes. So the way we think about this in, in a B plus tree is that the conventional wisdom is that, or the research shows, that the slower your storage device is, the larger you're going to want your page size to be for your, for your B plus tree. And this is because, again, we want to maximize the amount of sequential access or sequential I.O. that we're doing. So if we have a really slow spinning disk hard drive, we want something like in a one megabyte size for a page. Right? For one I.O. or one disk seek, when we go fetch in one megabyte data, there'll be an, enough. Uh, that's, it takes so long that we want to bring as many keys as we can when we do this. For modern SSDs, it's roughly around 10 kilobytes. And then if for in-memory, now you're down to like 512 bytes because you want to try to you keep everything aligned to your cache sizes, but you, you don't want to blow out your L3 cache, bringing in these large nodes. And of course, the, the optimal size you're going to want for your pages, uh, for your nodes, it depends on the workload. If you're doing a lot of point lookups, just going from the root to the leaf, and going fetching one thing, then maybe you want a smaller page size or smaller node size. But if you can do a lot of range scans along, along the leaf nodes, again, you want to maximize sequential I.O. So you want to you know, use larger node sizes, Sorry, right? Uh, yes? His, his question is, is one single node a page on the disk? Uh, I mean, the disk page, no. It's a database page, right? We talked about this. The Harvard page is four kilobytes. The database can have smaller or larger page sizes, any, any, anything at once. Okay, but still, like, one node is one database page. Yeah, the way they, again, so as, as I said, like, in some systems, you can have different page sizes for different components of the database. So, so... At a high level, yes, when you say one database page, but I don't want, I don't want you to think that like, throughout the, all the database system, every component has to have the same page size. But it's, it's something that the, the, the node size would equal an index page size managed by the database system. All right, so for bus tub, I think we default to four kilobyte pages just to keep things simple. All right, so the next thing we've got to deal with is, is the merge threshold. Um, so again, the, the textbook definition, the B plus tree, says that when a node is less, less than half full, you have to merge it, right? Because you don't want to violate the, that, that, that rule. But it may be some cases where you actually want to delay the merge operation, let the node temporarily violate this rule, because you're going to assume that it's going to get filled up pretty soon, and then you don't want to pay the penalty of, of merging it, and then gets filled again, and, and you get to split it again, right? So the... The way to think about this is like, you just say, all right, well, if it's one less than half or depending on what my height of the tree is, I'll, I'll let it go for a little bit, right? Obviously, if it's empty, then that's stupid. You, 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 know, you gotta merge it. Uh, but it may be some cases where you wanna just let it slide. And again, what the right policy is depends on the, on the, on the hardware, depends on what the, what the access pattern is for threads. Uh, so I don't wanna give like some numbers and this is what you should always do. Uh, but you know, these are some of the things that you, you could think about in, in your own implementation. Next thing we got to deal with is how, is how we do uh, variable length keys. Um, so we saw this when we talked about uh, variable length uh, tuples and variable length uh, you know, keys or objects in, in our hash table. And for the hash table, for simplicity, we said, OK, well, we're never going to have variable length keys to, to make our lives easier. But obviously, in a real, in a real system, 
this may not always be the case. So in general, those, those four approaches, um, we're not going to go into detail. I just want to bring them up real quickly. Um, so the easiest way to handle this is never store the actual value of a key. I have to be very clear here because there, there's the value of the key, then there's the value of the key value pair, right? So like the actual bytes of the key, you never store that in, in the B plus tree node. Instead, you store a pointer, like a, like a record ID, that then points to where the, the actual tuple is. It has that real data, right? And so in a disk system, this is bad because as I'm traversing, I, every time I got to do a comparison, like is my key less than whatever my guidepost keys are, uh, I got to go do, do a fetch in the page table to go get the, the actual tuple, then do a lookup to find the, the, the actual the value that I want. And so you never want to do this in a disk system. Where this shows up is actually in, in memory systems. So there's a variation of the B tree called the T tree uh, where they don't store the actual key bytes themselves in, in, the, in the nodes, they store the pointer. And you would do this in a very memory constrained environment because now you're not duplicating the key all throughout your, your tree. But for our purposes here, we don't want to do that. You could have variable length nodes. This makes things hard because now you have to, every time you could have fragmentation on disk, or fragmentation in memory, you got to deal with how to plug holes as, as you reclaim uh, nodes. Uh, another easy technique is to do padding. So if I say that I, I define my key or my, my I build, a, build, a, build an index on a column that's a varchar32, well, I'm always going to start, store 32 characters, no matter what the size of the key is. So that way I know exactly the size of the key, no matter what. Right? And this obviously is, is wasted space. Um, this is actually what MySQL gives you by default in some cases for the char type. So you, like, even though, like, even though like, you, say, you say, you know, I think char, you know, 256, if you store one character, it's still going to store 256 uh, characters. The, uh, the uh, most common alternative is this in, in, in key map in direction, right? Basically, you have a, if within the page itself, you would have an internal data structure, like a linked list, and say, it's almost like the dictionary uh, compression and coding stuff we talked about before. This, you know, my key is actually the, is represented by the integer, that's fixed length, and then I have this, uh, this indirection layer that I can manage within, within the node itself. If I need overflow, then I'll overflow. For, again, for, for project two, we'll assume that all the keys are fixed length integers. It makes, makes things a lot easier. All right, the next thing I say we have to deal with is how we actually do a lookup within the node as we're traversing to see whether our key actually exists, right? So the, the, the most easiest approach is just do a linear search across the, the key array within the node. Right, so say I'm looking, for, try to find key eight. I land on this node here. I don't care whether it's a root, a leaf, or inner node. Right, the search is all the same. So I'm just going to rip through, scan across linearly, one after another, until I find the thing that I'm looking for. And this will work regardless whether it's sorted or, or unsorted. Right. So this seems kind of slow. This can, like you know, if you have really large uh, node sizes uh, with a lot of keys. And so one way to speed this up in a modern system is to vectorize it using SIMD. I don't know who here, who has taken four, eighteen, six, eighteen yet. Does everyone know what SIMD is or no? Well, I know you know. <laughs> All right. So SIMD are these. It stands for uh, single instruction, multiple, multiple data. The basic idea is instead of having an instruction in the CPU that says you know one plus one equals and then some number, you take you know, one single, you know, one single data item, another single data item, add, like add them together. There's actually vectorized instructions. You can take a collection or an array of items. Uh, put them in a special register, and then do a single instruction to then do the, the whatever the operation you want across all the values within that within that uh, that register. So it would look like this. Uh, say I want to take the first four keys, assuming they're they're 32 bits, 32 bit integers, and then there's this Intel instruction here. SAC 128 bit registers. It, it's always going to be like all the SIMD stuff is always going to be esoteric. Uh, uh, instruction names like this. There's 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 libraries that hide this to you. I'm just showing you the raw one that I know, right? So I'm going to load a register with the value eight because that's the one I'm looking for. Eight copy or four copies of that because each one is 32 bits, 128 bit register, and then within a single instruction, I'll take the these these four eights here and compare it with the the four values here, and in a single instruction, I'll see whether I have a match. This SIMD instruction produces back a bitmap with a bit set to one if it's actually been a match or not. In this case here, I won't find it. And then I come to the next one, ignoring that it's three instead of four. We, we, we put an empty value in. But then another single instruction to do that comparison. 
right? So even though linear search, if I don't do the vectorized way, it could be slow, there's ways to speed this up in modern CPUs, right? And so sometimes the, the, the linear approach is actually a good idea. All right, another obvious one to do is binary search. Again, if, if you're maintaining the sort order, uh, then you just sort of jump around uh, at the halfway point to try to find what you're looking for. So I jump the halfway point here. Uh, I'm looking for eight. Seven is, is less than eight, so I, need to, I, need, I know I need to go to the right. Same thing here, look in the middle. Nine, I need to go to the left, and then I find eight, right? And the last one is less common, but it is uh, probably the fastest approach, if, if you can pull this off, is to do interpolation. And this is where if you know something about the distribution of the values of the keys, or the, the, key, or the, value, the distribution of the keys, uh, and that they're sorted and no gaps, you can just do a simple arithmetic to say, uh, I know what offset I should at least start at. Uh, in this case here, since it's 4 to 10, I just do that simple math, and I find the halfway point where my key should exist. Yes? In, like, in a normal research theory example, the eight study, you barely use interpolation. Where do you actually end up using it? The question is, in, in, sorry, the things you studied in this class? Like, till now, the examples we've seen using interpolation is not really something. Yeah, so, so, so his statement is, when, would you, when could you actually use this? Yeah. It only works if they're integers, right? This won't work if they're floating points. It only works if they're, uh, if they're sorted and there's no gaps, right? So where you could use this would be like, a, um, like an auto increment key or sequence or serial key where like you're, just, you're adding one to the primary key over and over again, right? So this is an optimization you can do. Uh, as far as I know, no real, no, nothing outside academic systems actually implement this. But it, it, it'll smoke everything if you can do it. Yes? Your, qu your question is, will we ever store the B plus tree on disk? Yes. yes. This whole course is about sorting on disk. Yes. I thought it's always on the memory. No. Well, you have to bring it into memory to do anything with it, right? It's a von no again, classic binomial architecture. I can't, I can't do any, uh, any manipulation or any um, uh, you know, traversal or accessing data unless I bring it into memory, right? So all this is, look, all this is assuming that like, after you bring it into memory, you can do all this. But I will have to write it out to disk, and that's what the buffer pool, the disk manager does for me. So when you build an index, do you store the index on the disk? This question is, if I, if I build an index, do I store the index on disk? In this class, yes. Yeah. Yes? Uh, in binary approach, can we also use SIM? This question is, for the binary approach, can you also use SIMD? Uh, I don't think... So SIMD is, again, I don't, I don't want to get into too much. Well, if you take the advanced class, we'll discuss this more. With SIMD, like, it's really good for sequential access of things. Jumping around to random locations is not really what SIMD is good for, right? So you couldn't really use vectorization for make binary search because it, it is like a bunch of jumps in, into the, to the array. And, uh, so you also mentioned that interpolation is only seen as being a why is that? Because the assumption that you have all the values with no gaps doesn't always play out in, in practice. Yes? Uh, could you go over how the offset is computed? How is this computed? Yeah. I know I'm looking for 8. Uh, I take the low value, and I have the high value here minus, minus the low value. And then I think the times 7 is the, the midpoint. So I, I know I should jump to four, uh, 4 offsets. So one, one, two, yeah. 1, 2, 3, 4. One over, that's what I want. So which is seven? Which seven, seven is, is, is the length, right? Yeah. Yeah, number of yeah, items. Yes, is the number of items, yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes? So for interpolation, do you just keep like an extra piece of like metadata on the node that like if it is full and doesn't have any gaps? Or... Yes, yeah, so the question is, would, do we need extra metadata to, so that this assumption holds? They know like we could do this? Yes. Binary search is probably most common, uh, followed by, at least in, in the newer system vectorization. The, um, I don't think Postgres, I don't think MySQL, I don't think any of the open source systems, uh, so the older ones do, do uh, like vectorized linear search, or ve yeah, vectorized linear search. All right. So there's a bunch of optimizations I want to go through, but uh, we just don't have time. Uh, so I want to sort of cover some quick ones. Uh, we'll cover, uh, 
pointer switch link and bulk insert. Um, a lot of the de deduplication prefix compression stuff, uh, that looks like a lot of the, the compression stuff we talked about before for column stores. Right? So I, I want to spend time specifically talking about um, the ones that are, that, 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 that are specific to B plus trees. Uh, for buffering updates, this is sort of the log structure stuff we talked about before, where maybe instead of, uh, it's called a B epsilon tree or, or, or a fractal tree. Basically, instead of me, every time I do a, a, a modification to a tree, instead of always applying that change right away, I'll just put a log entry somewhere in the tree. And then at some later point, when I accumulate enough of them, I'll, I'll compact them and apply the change. Right? No system, uh, let me see whether it's true or not. There was only one system that was doing the fractal tree, actually, because they owned the patent on it. It was called Tokutech. Uh, they got by, by, by Bercona. And I think they have a fractal tree index that does the buffered um, updates. They have an engine of that for, for MySQL. I, it might have been. It might have been end of life. I don't think everybody actually uses it, though. All right, prefix compression, we, we talked about before. Deduplication, again, same idea. I have the same, same key over and over again. I can store it once. Um, the suffix truncation, the idea here is that we can recognize that the, in some cases, we don't actually need the entire key in the guidepost, in the inner nodes. Um, so instead, we just truncate it uh, to be the, the sort of the, the minimum prefix we need to be able to discriminate whether we need to go left and right, that actually might be a better case, right? Again, this is to reduce space. Of course, obviously, if now uh, I have two strings that start with ABC, then I got to re reshuffle this or extend it out. The pointer swizzling one is, is very common, and this one is important. So the, the, the pointers within the, the, the nodes, uh, like so the root node and the inner nodes, the pointers are just page IDs, right? Because again, everything is, 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 is organized around these, these pages in memory. And we have these logical page IDs that I then have to go to your buffer pool, go to your page table, do a lookup to get that actual page in some frame in the buffer pool. Then I can actually access it, right? But that means that as I'm doing these traversals in my data structure, uh, I come across these, these pointers. Um, and I, ha I don't have a real pointer in memory. I have a page ID. Right, so then I got to go down to the, the buffer pool, say, hey, I need page two. It then maps that to a frame, and then I can access on it. Right? So again, as I'm traversing along, even for the sieving nodes, same thing. So with pointer swizzling, the idea is that if we pin the page in memory, meaning it won't move, won't move, move, move to a different frame, it's not going to get swapped out to disk, then in my, in my B plus tree, Instead of storing the, the, the logical page ID, which I then have to do a lookup every time, I can actually just replace it with the real pointer. So that avoids that, that lookup. Right? So that makes the, B plus, the, the traversal to the, the data structure much faster. Right? It's called swizzling for, for whatever reason. Like you're, just, you're converting this, this, this page ID in, into the actual memory pointer. Right? So his, his statement is, isn't it, isn't it when I do my lookup for the, uh, from a page ID to the buffer pool, isn't that a hash table lookup, which should still be fast? It's not going to be as fast as, as just jumping to the location of memory. OK, so, oh, so that's where the constant matters. Yes, yeah, so the statement is that's where the constant matters. Yes, and also, too, like, you have to make your page table uh, thread safe. right? So now i got to take a latch to go into the page table to get this, to get the actual memory address. So, so you know, the, for this today's lecture, we're talking about how we take latches in the B plus tree. So now, without pointer swizzling, I'm taking latches in the, in the B plus tree nodes as I'm going down. But then, as I do lookups to get the actual memory address of the page, I got to take latches in that page table. Then I can traverse down. It's way faster just to, to avoid having to touch, talk to the buffer pool at all. Okay, let, 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 let's, let's come back to that. Let's, any more questions about pointer swizzling, swizzling stuff? Yes? Uh, is, this is more about like, the buffer pool uh, in terms of how like, optimizations there might affect this. Are you ever interested in, like, say you have like, pages that you're doing sequential access, but it spans multiple pages? Are you ever interested in, in reordering uh, or like, compacting the pages that are present in uh, like, your frame? in a way that 
that is at odds with the, if you're trying to move around uh, pigs inside your buffer pool. So his question is, could it, could it be possible that the buffer pool would ever want to reorganize pages? You can't compact pages because they're pages on disk, well, right? Well, compact them in the sense of like defrag your free frame. I mean, re, 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 reorganize, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any case that, that the buffer pool manager would want to reorganize pages and therefore this, if you do this, this won't work? Um, I actually don't know whether they actually do that. I think Postgres leaves it the way it is. I think for MySQL, I don't know what the commercial guys do, right? The like, is that even worth doing? Though? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't actually know what they. You could do it. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, like the that's like a low-level hardware optimization where, like, maybe the memory prefetcher could be could help you on the hardware. The, the latches are sort of a, bit, a, layer, a layer above that, and that's, that's the high pull in the tent, the thing you want to minimize. So, so not going to the buffer pool manager to get, get these page lookups. That's a bigger win than possibly reorganizing memory. But I, I might be wrong. I right, see. So, yes, quick. Yes. I'm just curious about what happens when the page is ready to be swapped out. I mean, it's unpinned. So does this get, get reverted? Does it... oh, so, so his question is, how does this work if, if this page needs to get swapped out? It has, you have to pin it. This doesn't work if you don't pin it. Cause so eventually, when it does get unpinned, his statement is, if, if it eventually gets unpinned, uh, how would this actually work? Somebody needs to go figure out, okay, I, I've swizzled these things, and again, flip a bit or flip something to say it's no longer swizzled and use the page IDs. So you have, there's some bookkeeping you have to do to know you've done this. All right, so his question is, more, is going back to the, uh, going back to the, the, the suffix truncation. Yes. Yeah, so basically here we're using uh, a string as like the, the index key, right? Yes. Ah, so, so his question is, in my example here, I'm showing you know, a string. String comparison is slow, because you have to go by, you know, byte by byte. Uh, although you can vectorize that in some cases. But the, is it better to use an integer representation and then do comparison on those? If it's dictionary compressed, yes. But most times, in most systems, it's not. Right? Think of, like, think of these B plus trees. Again, it's not for, we, we're not going to use... We don't care about performance for B plus trees for analytics because those are doing long scans. That's really slow. This is really for like transactional things, operational workloads. So I want to be in and out as quickly as possible of, of the nodes. So having to decompress things, that, that adds additional overhead. Okay, so pointer swing is, is, is very common. Uh, I'll say the last thing about, say about this one too is that uh, the... You still have to maintain in, in the page, like you, you basically you allocate a little extra space in the page in the header that says, okay, like, or sorry, in, in the um, in the pointers to, to the, the children nodes within this node, you you leave a little extra space and say, okay, here's the swizzled uh, pointer, right? And then the you just have to know that if I then write this out back to disk, the page out the disk, when I fetch it back in, I make sure I invalidate any of those swizzled addresses because otherwise. It can now be pointing to a location of memory that doesn't exist anymore, right? Uh, but you, you would store this this you would store these swizzle pointers within the page because you already you know you're already accessing the page. All right, the last optimization uh, is with the bulk insert, and basically, if you uh, if you know you need you know build a B plus tree and you have all the keys ahead of time, instead of just going you know iterating one by one on each key and trying to build the the B plus tree organically. Um, it's actually faster to just sort the keys ahead of time, which I'll talk you how to teach you how to do that next class. Um, and then you just, along the leaf nodes, you just put them in sorted order, and then you build the, the index from the, from the, the bottom to the top. Right? You build all the sort of scaffolding above it. So my example here, I'm leaving you know, one extra space within the leaf nodes. Uh, some systems will actually compact it to be 100% full immediately. Right? just to, to minimize space. Pretty simple optimization, right? And I think if you call re-optimize or optimize on an index, this is essentially what, what they do as well. They'll, they'll scan out all the, 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 the keys. Well, it's already sorted, but you basically just get all the keys and the leaf nodes and then uh, <laughs> compact it and then build it from the bottom to the top. OK? All right, again, as I said, different systems have different types of optimizations. Uh, 
But the, the, you know, the, the, the swizzling one is probably the most common one, and then followed by the sorting. All right, so. All right, so let's talk about how you make these, these B plus trees thread safe. Or actually, any, any data structure thread safe, but I'll spend most of the time to talk about B plus trees. Um, again, project one is due uh, this upcoming Sunday. And again, we have the special office hours uh, on Saturday. All right, so, so far, for the most part, we've assumed that all our data structures are single threaded. Um, but obviously, in a modern system where we have a lot of cores, uh, CPU cores, we want to be able to have multiple threads access our data structures safely at the same time. And we're going to do this essentially to hide disk stalls, disk stalls. So if one thread is, is run, one thread's running a query and then it needs something that's not in memory and not in the buffer pool, it's got to go out and disk and get it. We want to have another thread continue uh, and make forward progress. Of course, that means that you know, if everything is in memory, they could be touching the same data structure at the same time, and we want to make sure that everything works out okay. So the things I'll talk about today is pretty much what, how every system works. Uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, VoltDB and HDOR, HDOR is the system I built that came VoltDB. Uh, Redis is probably one you're probably more familiar with. These are all single-threaded engines, meaning they assume that no other thread is running at the same time. So they're going to avoid all the crap we're talking about today. They don't do any of this, right? In the case of Redis, it's, it's one thread per process. So if you, if you want to have a multi-threaded version, you basically have multiple processes. In the case of VoltDB, it's a single process, but then the threads are partitioned per core, so they know that you, can't, you don't have a query touching two cores at the same time. We'll cover this uh, la later in the semester. Um, but it, it doesn't say that the, this latching stuff is pretty much how everybody does it. There are some systems that, that are the exception. So the way we're going to make this all work is through what is called a concurrent joke protocol. And the idea is that Think of this as like the, the traffic cop in the database system that is going to be responsible for making sure that the, the, the different threads use our data structures data structure in the, in the proper way and to make sure that the operations they want to do at the same time don't corrupt, the, don't corrupt anything and don't co cause any problems. So there's going to be two sort of correctness criteria that we have to worry about in our data structure. Um, and the first one is going to be the, the logic of correctness, meaning can our thread see the things in, in the data structure that it's supposed to see? Like if I insert key foo, and then I come back and try to read key foo, should I be able to see it, yes or no, right? The other thing we have to worry about is physical correctness, where it's the integrity of the data structure. The internal representation is actually correct, meaning if we follow a pointer to something that the data structure says is a valid pointer, we don't land in no man's land in our address space and crash, or we don't land to a page that doesn't exist anymore or see incorrect data, right? So this is about protecting the, the, the internal representation of, of the physical data structure, like the pointers and so forth. So the, one we, the thing we're going to care about for this class is this one here. There's a higher level concept of correctness, this logical concept, like insert, if I insert a key, can I read it back? That's concurrency control for, for, for data. We'll cover that after the midterm. This is really about making sure that we don't crash because we follow a pointer to, to nowhere, OK? So we're going to talk about how you actually implement the latches in our, in our database system. <laughs> then we'll start with a simple example of doing hash table latching with a line, linear probe hashing. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about how to do B plus trees and then leaf node scans uh, that, that are thread safe as well, OK? Hash tables are easy. B plus trees are hard. So that's what we'll sort of build up to it. So I mentioned in the beginning of the semester, uh, there was this, this, this distinction between locks and latches, right? I said if you're coming from, the, from a more systems background, a non-database systems background, uh, what we refer to as latches, they would refer to it as locks. But in a database world, locks are this higher level logical protection concept or primitive that's going to protect uh, threat or queries from uh, transactions from other queries and transactions running at the same time. Right? So like, I could take a lock on a, on, a, on a single record, and I would hold that for the duration of, of my transaction, of my query. And then if we, the, the database system will have these uh, additional mechanisms to make sure there's no deadlocks and know how to roll back changes if you need to abort, abort a transaction, abort a query. For this class, again, we're talking about latches. These are the low-level primitives that, that are going to protect the, 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 fi the physical internals of the critical section uh, of our data structure from other threads trying to do the same time. And we're only going to hold these, these latches for very brief periods. 
right? Get into a node or get into a page, do one thing and then pop out and release the latch. And then we don't need to worry about rollback any changes because if we can't acquire the latch for the thing we need to do, then we shouldn't do it. And we can abort the whole operation and start over again. And again, this, this will make more sense as we go along. So there's this great table uh, from actually that, that B plus G book I talked about before, where they sort of lay out the distinction in more detail about locks and latches. Again, for this class, we're focusing on this, but the latches are gonna be used to separate threads from one, one another for in-memory data structures. Again, assuming things that you know, could be disk resident, but I could bring it into memory. Um, and it'd be for the critical sections, and I can only do it, have sort of two modes for my latches, read and write. Uh, and the way I'm gonna avoid deadlocks is just through coding discipline to make sure I don't be, to write stupid code or stupid programs that can have deadlocks. And we'll see how to handle that. And we're, we're, the latches themselves will be maintained within the data structure. Again, we'll cover all of this, the, the locking stuff in, 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 uh, in lecture 15. Just again, think of latches as like the, the standard mutex you used for the first project, right? All right, so in latches, there's only two modes, read mode and write mode. So with read mode, uh, sometimes called shared mode, um, the, you can have two threads hold, or multiple threads hold the same latch in read mode simultaneously as long, you know, as long as they're not making any changes, everything's fine. If you need to make changes to the data structure, like, like update something, delete something, whatever, uh, again, not the entire data structure, you could have a latch entire data structure, but like, you know, some, some critical section, a critical piece of, of the, the internal of your data structure, if you need to make changes to it, you have to take the latch into write mode. And only one thread and only one thread could ever have the latch in write mode at any given time. So a simple, it's the simple compatibility matrix looks like this. So say I have two threads. If the first thread has, wants, has it in read mode, the got, other guy wants to get it in read mode, those things are commutative, you can do those together. But if any one thread has the latch in write mode, no matter what other mode the, the other thread wants, you can't, you can't share the latch at the same time. Right? All right, so I want to quickly talk about how you actually implement this, uh, just so you sort of know what, what's going on underneath the covers. And again, I think OS class would, would cover all these things. The simplest thing to do is the blocking OS mutex. This is what you get from, if you use standard mutex, right? And you just have something like this. It only has one mode, lock, right, exclusive mode. So I can quiet the lock here, do something special with my data structure, and then it just unlock it, right? Nothing fancy there. If you use standard mutex, what do you actually get? Does anybody know on Linux? Yes. Well, we'll get there. P thread mutex, which is just a futex. What is a futex? It's a component uh, that you try and paste and then otherwise it falls back to the kernel thing. Yeah, so he said it's a, it stands for futex, stands for fast user mutex. The, the way to think about it is there's a user space spin lock that you acquire without having to go down to the kernel. If you can acquire it, great, you're done. Uh, if you can't acquire it, then you fall back to a heavyweight mutex in the OS, right? And again, from a database perspective, that's bad because now the OS is deciding when, when your thread is going to get scheduled. Uh, and that's a syscall. That's expensive. And then now we can't use that thread for anything else. So in general, you, you, for this class, it's okay to use, use the standard mutex, but in real systems, you would not want to use this, right? Right, so basically it looks like this. So I would have my, my futex, I have a use space latch, and then the OS latch. So I have two threads come along. They both want to acquire the latch at the same time. Right? It only has one mode, in this case here, exclusive. Uh, first guy gets it, so he, he can do whatever he wants. Second guy then falls back to the OS latch. And now the, the, the OS scheduler will deschedule it and won't get, it will not get woken up until the, uh, until the, the first guy releases the latch. All right. All right, the other type of latch we can have is a reader writer latch. And again, for our purposes in this class, we're saying use, use the, the, the standard, standard library shared mutex, uh, which is just a p thread write, read write lock. Um, but the idea here is that we can now put a latch into two different modes, uh, either the, the, the read or the write mode. So basically, it looks like this there's a single logical concept of a latch, uh, and it keeps internal counters for how many threads hold the latch and how many threads are waiting for the latch. There's actually like a priority queue as well to keep track of like, you know, do you need to know what threads to wake up? Uh, but we can ignore that for now. So first thread comes along, wants to get the latch in read mode. Says, says nobody has, holds in a write mode, nobody holds in read mode. We can go ahead and acquire that. It gets the latch and we just incre incre incremental this counter by one. 
Next thread comes along, also wants to get it in read mode. Uh, since it's commutative, we, we can get it at the same time. We're good there. This guy wants to come along. He wants to get it in the write mode. And because it's already in read mode, he has to block and he waits. And then depending on the fairness algorithm that's implemented in your, in your latch implementation, the next guy comes along. He also wants, wants to get read mode. So even though that this thing is commutative with the read, the read, read mode, and therefore he could acquire it right, uh, right now, for, in terms of fairness, it's going gonna, it's gonna to block this one because uh, it says it knows that somebody else is waiting for the right latch, and it wants to make sure that, that this guy can get it when, when they finish up. Right? So the main thing I, that I, I want to stress here is that the, the amount of metadata we have to store for this latch is much larger than, than the, the Futex one. Right? I could actually even, instead of using the, 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 the pthread mutex, I could just do my own spin latch in user space, and therefore I just need to store you know, a single byte or 32 bits. Like it's going to latches are stored in, in the pages with, with the data structure itself. And this thing here, you have queues, you have counters, right? This is, this is a lot more expensive. But because it's, um, we can now have a sh you know, shared mode, we can potentially get more comparalism because of this extra metadata we're storing. All right? Again, there's all the other types of latches. If you lead, read the, the Linux mailing list, uh, you know, Linus is like, don't, you know, database people got it wrong. You should never use. They should not roll their own latches. I disagree with that in some cases. Like, but for our purpose in this class, the, the standard template library will, 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 will suffice. But just know a lot of the real systems won't actually do this. They'll roll their own. All right, so let's see how we, how we can actually start using them all right, to protect our data structures. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, hash table latching. So in this case here, we're going to start with a linear probe hashing uh, because it's, it's the most simplistic hash table. Um, and we don't have to worry about uh, you know, the, 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 the slot array and all the extra stuff we need to do in the, in the extendable hashing and linear hashing, right? And so the other thing that's interesting about the, this linear probe hashing table is because the threads are always going to traverse the data structure in the same direction, we never have to worry about deadlocks, right? Because it's always hashed to a single location and then scanned down to I find what I'm looking for. You never have two threads going in reverse direction, which would, which would cause a deadlock. Right? So the, the, for resizing the table, we can ignore that. But basically, think you have a, a global right latch that, that sort of gates anyone coming into the data structure. So if you set that, then nobody else can actually then jump into the data structure and see other things. Right? It's not ideal because it's a single latch on the data structure. But if you have to resize, then this is the, the easiest way to do this. All right, so there's two, way, two types of latches we can hold. And this is, again, a classic trade-off between in computer science of like storage versus compute. So I can have page latches where within each page I have a single, single latch. And I could, I, could, I could do it in you know, read or writer mode as well. Um, but that's going to protect the entire contents of the page no matter how many slots or how many entries I have in there. Or I could have a single latch per slot itself. Again, with either you know, read-write mode or a single, single, single mode. Right? And the, on one hand, with the page latch, it's less, less metadata storage overhead to maintain you know, uh, you know, individual latches per slot. But again, it reduces the amount of parallelism I could achieve. Right? So let, let's see a really simple example here. So we just had three pages, uh, two slots each per page. Thread one wants to come along. He wants to find D. So do we have a hash up? We land on this page here. Again, we're doing page latches. So there's a single page latch that protects the whole thing. I'll put it in read mode. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and start scanning through to find what I'm looking for. Thread two come, wants to come along. He wants to insert E. So he hashes to this page here. Wants to acquire the latch on the page. But because we're doing insert, we know we have to do put it into write mode. So write mode is not compatible with read mode. So he has to stall and he waits. Right? Thread one scans through, tries to find, tries, he's looking for D. It's not in this slot here. So now he wants to jump down to uh, this page here. So at this point, uh, thread one can actually release the latch on the first page because it's linear probe hashing. These pages are, are sort of represented in logical order. right? Just think of like it's page zero, page one, page two. We know that there's not going to be a page magically slipped in here where it could, could end up, someone could put the thing that it's looking for here. right? 
So we know at this point here, once we reach the end, we, we just finished page one. Now we need to look at, at, at page two. So at this point, it's, it's safe for us to release the latch. Right? And then now, the, now the, the, it can do the scan here while thread two scans uh, and tries to find the first free slot where it can write. Yes? So, so his statement is, uh, in, that's, it's, an, it's an optimization we'll get to. Um, he correctly points out that at, at this point here, uh, thread two is just really just trying to find the first free slot it could write into. So it could take a read latch uh, instead, of, instead of the write latch, and then scan through, recognize that there's no free space here, then jump down to the next one, and then take a read latch again, scan through, find this, then come back and change it to a write latch, uh, to avoid having to take relatches all the way down. Yes, that, we'll see that in B plus trees. Yes, you're jumping way ahead. Th that, that is the optimization, yes. All right. But the main thing, again, main thing I want to point out here is that at this point here, once we recognize that, uh, that we're jumping down here, we don't need to maintain the latch for, for the, 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 the page we just came from. And that won't always be the case in B plus trees. All right. All right. So this guy goes through. He gets the, he gets the right latch. And then he's going to go ahead and insert uh, insert the entry that he wants, and we're done. So again, this is with page latches. Let's see how to do the same th same thing with slot latches. So this guy starts off. He gets the right the read slot read latch on the first slot here. Uh, he starts looking for the thing he wants. This guy gets the right latch on this slot here because he's trying to do an update. So he's fine. He gets that. Then this guy has to stall because he, as he's scanning through in linear probing. He can't get the read latch on this, so he has to wait. Uh, this next guy scans down. He, same thing. He gets the right latch on that. He releases the, the latch on the previous one. This guy can, can, can now get that. He jumps down here. Same thing. Stalls and waits until this guy finishes up. He does the right, uh, and then this guy gets the read latch and does the read. All right? Pretty straightforward. All right, let's make it harder. Let's talk about, let's talk about B plus trees. All right. So same thing as before. We want to have multiple threads go through our data structure and read and update key, key entries uh, at the same time. So in this case here, there's two problems we're going to need to prevent. The first is going to be we have threads trying to write to the same node at the same time. All right. That's, that's, e that's easy to deal with, right, in theory. Uh, the more challenging one is going to be where we have one thread traversing the index and then another thread is down below, farther down into the tree, and they start making structural changes because they have to split or merge. And we need to make sure that the, the thread that's coming up behind it doesn't, again, follow a pointer that, that, that goes, goes to nowhere. Right? So let's see, let's see a more complex example. So I've, named, I've labeled the nodes that we're mostly going to be talking about over here, A through I. Right? My first thread comes along. He wants to leap 44 down here in the leaf node. So without any taking any latches, he's just going to traverse down, do the comparison within the, the keys to decide whether he wants to go left and right, reaches the bottom here, uh, and deletes it. And then now we're we're empty, so we have to do we have to do a merge, right, to rebalance the tree. But at this point, for whatever reason, it gets uh, the, it gets descheduled. The OS or whatever says, "Hey, you're not running anymore," so the thread stalls and it sleeps. Meantime, thread two comes along. They want, to, they want to find 41 down here in a leaf node. So same thing. They traverse down. They get down here. They get to this node here. They do the comparison for the keys that are, that are in node D. 41 is less than 44, so we know we need to go down this path here. But then it gets stalled. It gets, it gets put to sleep. The first thread wakes up. He does the reshuffling. Uh, he goes away. Now the second thread wakes up follows this pointer down to the bottom, and they see nothing, right? This is the best case scenario, because you, you get a false negative, right? You say the, the key that should be there, the, the data structure says it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, Unless, I mean, it's all bad, right? It's, it's bad to get bad results, but I, it's a philosophical question. The alternative is the crash, right? Because I could have I've could have swapped out this page here, so now this pointer takes me to nowhere, right? Uh, and then the, the system seg falls and crashes. Whether or not you, incorrect results versus crashing is better, 
uh, it's up to you, right? So we need a way to handle this. And so the technique we're going to use is called latch crabbing or latch coupling. I think textbook and Wikipedia refer to it as latch, latch coupling. Um, but it essentially means the same thing. So this is the protocol we're going to use as threads traverse our index that's going to allow them to access and modify the BBLS tree at the same time to ensure that we don't have any of those physical, physical, physical correctness issues in our data structure. So the basic idea is that, is that every time we want to traverse the node, we get, we get a uh, starting at the root, we get a latch on, on, the, on the parent, then we get a latch for the child below it, where we want to go. And then once we recognize that, that the parent is safe from any, any structural changes, it's safe for us to release the latch on, on the parent. And we just keep doing this recursively, going down the data structure until we reach the leaf node and we have everything we need. And my definition of safe is that if we're doing an insert, we know that it's not full, meaning if I have to do a split below it, I'll have a space to absorb the new key that gets pushed up. And then if it's on delete, then we know that we won't have to do a merge if we remove an entry, uh, remove an entry in that parent. Yes? So uh, in this case, like, if you require a latch in a parent that's not safe, but if subsequent children are all safe, uh, we still won't release the latch on the top parent, right? His question is, and we'll see the example, his question is, if we, re if we reach a lower point in the tree, and like two level ups, uh, we know we're safe. Can we release the, patch, the latches on those? Yes. Right, it's called latch crabbing because it's supposed to be like the way like a, a crab walks. It's sort of like that. Yes. We did, uh, before, uh, sorry, we said before that uh, uh, you could release the parent. You don't have to do a merge on deletion. But uh, don't we also have to keep the, the latch on the parent if we have to borrow from the IP from the children? Yes, yeah, so his question is, uh, he's correct that, that I said, if you don't have to do a merge, then, then don't do a lesion. If I have to move somebody over, then yes, I, I would have to do that as well. Yes. But you would only do that at the, at the leaf nodes, not, not the inner nodes. All right, so let me go through examples here. Um, this is just more formally describing every, everything I said. All right. So say we want to find 38. Again, start, start at, the, at, the, at the root. Uh, we're going to take the, the uh, node A in, uh, in read mode. We tend to take a node B in read mode. Um, and at this point here, because we're doing a read-only operation, it's safe for us to go ahead and release the, the, the latch on A. So we go ahead and do that. Then we get the latch on D, traverse down, same thing, because it's a, it's a, it's a lookup, it's a find operation. We can release the latch on B. Then we get to the leaf node here, same thing. Uh, we get the H, release the node on D. We find the answer we're looking for, and, and we're done. Right? So you're just always releasing the parent behind you as you go down for searches. All right, let's see a delete. So take the root node in, ex in exclusive, uh, so the root node in exclusive, a uh, right latch mode. Uh, then we come down to B. Uh, and at this point here, since we know that uh, we may need to call less B, but depending on what happens below us, we can't release the latch on A at this point. Because if we end up deleting a, the guidepost key in B, we'd end up uh, propagating that, that, restructure, that restructuring up to the, to the root, mode, root node. So we have to maintain the, the latch on A. But when we get down to D, now we see, OK, well, we have two keys here. So if I have to delete anything below D, then I, I can absorb that, that, that deletion in D. So therefore, it's safe for me to delete or to remove the latches on A and B at this point. All right? So what order should we release the latches? He said, does it matter? Is, is that a question or a statement? He says from the, to from the top to avoid deadlocks. But how can it be deadlocks? Everyone's going down to the bottom. Nobody's going this way. It's only one direction. There's no deadlocks. Yes? It's more efficient to go from top to bottom, right? Because then other like, queries can access the top even. Yes, so he's, he's correct. So he says it's more efficient if you release them from the top to the bottom because, in this case here, everyone's coming to the root, taking the right latch. So as soon as I can release that, then that allows somebody else to come in and potentially go down this side of the tree. Right, so I want to go from the top to the bottom. Uh, basically, first in, first out. I, yes. Uh, can we run, like, can we, like, in parallel release it? Because deletion was, like, so... His statement is, can you, can, in parallel, can you release it? Yeah. Uh, how would you do that? Just tell, you know, spawn, like, 
threads than the gold with the little silk. <laughs> what is the cost of spawning a thread? I don't know. But maybe you have like a thread pool or something. What is the cost of sending a message to a thread pool? I don't know. A lot more expensive than than flipping a bit to turn to turn a latch off. Yeah. We want to avoid thread communication. Um, yeah, I can't think of any. Uh, no, no, yeah, sorry. You, in, in theory, you, if you align the latches in a sequential array, you could then do a vectorized operation to flip their bits. Uh, but nobody, I don't think anybody does that. Yeah. I've seen even for a runtime in a sequential array, it's like three. Right? If you don't store the latches in, in the actual tree themselves, so you store it somewhere else in memory. But nobody does that, as far as I know. Yes? His question is, at this point here, my thread is pointing at D. How do I know that D is not going to have to do a merge? Because if, because if I, because I can only do one operation on one key at a time. So I can only, I'm only deleting 38, right? So at this point here, I don't know what's below me, but I know that in H or D right now, that if I have to delete one of these keys, I'm, I'm not going to have to merge, right? So any change below me will be isolated to just at D and below not above D. So that's why it's safe to release the right latches above it. All right, so we get here. Uh, at this point here, we recognize in H that the, uh, again, we don't want them to emerge, so we can release the latch on D and we're done, All right? So let's look at a more complicated example. Let's, let's, or let's insert 45. All right, so same thing, right latch at A. At this point here, at B, I recognize that if I have to split below, I can put a new key into B, so I can release the latch on A. If you get down on D, now in this case here, I don't know what's going to happen below me. Uh, as it's going to get down here, I may have to propagate the change up here. So when I'm at D, I can't release the latch on B, but when I get to I, I recognize that, okay, I have a space for that, so therefore I can release the latches on, on in D and B above me. And you would do, you, would, you want to release the latches as soon as possible. So you release, recognize you can release the latch, release them, then do whatever is the operation you want to do on the node. Right? Because that gives the opportunity for other threads to potentially go down and do, uh, do other changes in, in, the, in the data structure of the parts. All right, so let's see now when we have to do uh, split. So we're going to insert 25. Okay, start at A, take the right latch on A. Uh, go down to B, take the right latch on B. B recognizes that at this point here that we're not going to have to propagate any changes above B. So we release the, re release the right latch on, on A. Then we get down here. Uh, again, same thing. We know that we can absorb any, the in, any new inserted key uh, at C and below. So we release the right latch on B. But then now when we get to F, we recognize at this point, okay, we are going to have to do a split. So we can't release the right latch on, uh, on C. So now, you know, just do the insert. We can ignore sibling keys for now. But now, because I hold the right latch on C, I can do whatever changes I want to it. I can put a new key in, allocate it, uh, a, a new leaf node, and then have a pointer going out there, right? So again, because the changes might propagate up the parts of the tree, you don't want to you don't want to release the latches until it's safe. All right. So he sort of already brought this up before. Uh, so somebody other than him, let's think about how we can optimize this even further. And so in all the cases when I had to manipulate or modify the B plus tree, what was the very first thing I always did? Lock the root, right? Latching the root uh, with the right latch, right? So this is essentially making our data structure almost be single threaded. Yes, I can do the crabbing thing where I can release the latches as, as I go further down when I know it's safe. But if you know, this is basically, if all the threads have to come in and, and, do, and do a lot of updates, that actually even reads, I'm always going to have to take this, this latch on the root node, right? So taking the latch on the root node every single time is going to become a big, big bottleneck as I scale up the amount of activity or the amount of concurrency I want in my data structure. So a really simple optimization is what he sort of brought up for the hash table one, where you assume that the modifications to that are going to require splits and merges are going to be rare in, in your B plus tree. 
So therefore, you take reed latches all the way down, assuming things are going to be okay. Then when you reach the relief node, uh, then you determine, okay, was my assumption correct or not? If yes, then I just take the right latch on, on the leaf node, do the one thing I need to do, and then I'm done. If I'm wrong, then I just start the search all over again, but now I'll use the more pessimistic approach that, I, that we did. Right? So this, this, this optimistic, optimistic approach is very common in other, in other parts of database systems and concurrency. Actually, outside of databases, this is, this is widely used, where you assume that the, the things that are caused problems in your data structure, whatever it is you need to do, are rare, and you take the fast path. And if you get it wrong, you just undo your changes or roll back and, and start over again. We'll see the same technique applied again when we talk about transactions and locks. So the algorithm is the same as before for searches, just read latches all the way down using the crabbing technique. But for insert delete, we'll set read latches as we go along. And then when we get the leaf node, we set a right latch to determine whether it's safe at that point. If yes, then, then we apply our change and we're done. If no, we restart the whatever the operation that we want to do. And we don't have to undo any changes because we didn't make any changes. We took read latches all the way down, recognized that our assumption was incorrect, and start over. So the this works great when there's low contention because you know 99% of the time, 100% of the time, my assumption is going to be correct. Obviously, if there's a lot of threading, there's a lot of threads trying to manipulate the, or modify the database at the same time, you will have contention and you end up doing a lot of wasted work. You would traverse down optimistically, recognize you're wrong, and set the start over. So, but in general, for most workloads, this, this works out to be the, the, right, the right thing to do. So let's see an example. So let's, see, let's do that delete 38 one. Again, so I take, I'm going to take relatches all the way down, do my same crabbing stuff that I've done before, where I release it from the parent. Then I get down to uh, the leaf node here. I take the, the right latch. Recognize that we're safe, so therefore let's go ahead, let's go ahead and release the latch on D, and then now I can make the change uh, that I want on this leaf node, and I'm done. Let's do the insert 25 one. So take read latches all the way down. Uh, again, latch crabbing as we oops, sorry, latch crabbing as we go down. I don't know why I paused there. Uh, anyway, so get here, get the right latch. Recognize that I am going to have to split, so I, I have to abort the whole operation, come back and start over and do it the way we did before. Yes? Uh, why do we need to, like, wouldn't it be more optimal to just keep track of what the last component would be? In this case, I can just keep track in my mind that I need to start from C again. I don't need to start from A again. So, so his statement is, um, what I've said is that if I get to this bottom here, recognize I'm wrong, I have to start over. Couldn't I just keep track of that? Okay, C is where I want to start from next time instead of traversing all the way down. Uh, what happens if someone deletes C? But you need a right latch on C. You need to get a right latch on the first time. Instead of just saying crab all the way down to C, you want C in the first place. So your statement is instead of like, well, I, don't have, I don't have the steps, but as, as I get here, yeah. recognize that C is the one level, below, uh, one level above the leaves. So never take a right latch on that. You keep track of what's the safest one. Or like what's the safest trend just above the leaf. I mean, it's... I think you can make it correct, but it's like... It, it depends. Uh... I mean, if you have like multiple right threads, that might... Yeah, if, if you have multiple right, right threads, it doesn't work. Uh... It... So, like, how does it say this? As you increase the amount of contention or co conflicts, then yes, your approach might actually might be better. But if I assume that the conflicts are rare, then it's, I'm, it's one less right latch I have to take, which is always better. Yes? Does it make some sense to start on the optimistic approach and then at some level uh, switch to the pessimistic approach if you believe that, for instance, in the two or three last levels, it's always more likely to, to, to so his statement is, couldn't the system keep track of that I, that I have to restart over and over again? And then at some point, is, is that what you're saying or no? No, like my question was, uh, can we start on the optimistic approach and then switch uh, according to some uh, heuristics and trends, always switch to the pessimistic uh, level uh, when we are in the last few levels of optimistic? 
Oh, sorry, 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 sorry his, his, his idea. Uh, yeah, so I mean, so yeah, you could try to be, you could try to be clever and try to handle that case. Uh, but as I said, like if, it, yes, that, that approach would be basically his, would be a little bit smarter rather than all or nothing, just do it some of the time. Where I actually thought you were gonna say was, could you keep, could the data system keep track of that my threads are having to restart over and over again? And at some point if I reach a threshold where I say, I'm wasting a lot of time restarting this thing, let me just always just use the pessimistic approach, right, all the way down. But yours is sort of halfway through. Yes, in the back. What about keeping metadata in sort of the internal mode that would suggest whether or not we're connected that it has to extend to people? Like stuff like number of children, particular things, or just like how stuck we are. That if we, like, let's say we're at B and we're going left, we're like, okay, no matter what, I'm definitely going to have to go pessimistic, quit now. So the statement is what if we kept extra metadata in the inner nodes about what, looks like, lo what things look like down below? So that I could have hints in B, for example, to say, okay, well, you're probably gonna have to split down here. So, so at this point going forward, take read latches. You could do that, but it's, it's additional bookkeeping you have to maintain. And it might be cheaper, it's usually cheaper just not to do that. Uh, did the academia or industry have some effort in looking to the fox free data structure and using Rust for handling it? Okay, so he said two things. Anybody in academia or research, or actually even this industry, looked at Lock-free data structures, yeah. yes, and then you said Rust. Yeah. Why does Rust make this special or different? As well, why some data usage, well, it, it may simplify certain cases, not all the things, but... That Rust would somehow make this magically better or easier? Uh, it might be, I mean... It, I don't think it will. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, Rust is good, but it's not like, you know, it's not like it's a magic thing. Like, how do I say this? I'm not that old, but I've, I've, I've been through enough waves or like there's the hot thing. Rust is hot now, Go was hot a few years ago. And then people always sort of incorrectly think that like somehow this new programming language will make hard problems go away and it doesn't. Uh, I mean, me Rust is about like memory correctness, not necessarily like these things. This is like lock correctness, latching correctness. Uh, but your first thing was what about latch-free data structures, lock-free data structures? Absolutely, yes, these exist. But again, under high contention, uh, actually, we have a research paper I can share on Piazza where we actually built Microsoft's lock-free data structure called the BW tree. We actually built it at CMU. The guy that implemented it was a, he was a master student, MSCS. The dude wrote it in Notepad on Windows, and he made his Windows computer look like it was Windows 95. With, and he wrote it in Comic Sans. It did, like, next level, right? Insane. Um, <laughs> But no, like when we did the, when we actually built it and then we compared it against like a well-written B plus tree, the, the B plus tree smokes it, right? The worst data structures are skipless, which is, which is latch free. That's always bad, right? The, a, a, well, a good B plus tree will crush these things. Yes? Uh, being constantly in terms of memory and speed or in terms of like correctness? Speed, I'm correct. Uh, speed, uh, sorry, all the data structures will be correct, right? <laughs> it better be, it better be it's all correct. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Under high contention, because you have to spin. Um, well, in the case of the BW tree, you you had a separate lookup table where you kept track of the logical uh, tree IDs, the node IDs. So you, it's almost like the buffer. You had to look that thing up to find the thing you're looking for. And there was all this extra compare and swap magic you have to do to make this work. Yeah, it's not. I'll send. I'll send the paper. It's not. No, no, it's, <laughs> yes. So, so you mentioned like uh, those compare, uh, compare and swap. Um, if you have like a slightly different uh, like atomic model, like if you have like a load length or conditional, is it like better in practice or? So uh, it, your question is if, if, you, if you use like conditional variables instead of? No, no, no. So like um, like x86 has like fair chain. Yes. Right? But like ARM, for instance, has like load exclusive, like store exclusive. Um, if your atomics are like structured differently, is it? Let's, okay, let's pause that. Yeah, and that's not this class. That's, that's the advanced class. Yes. Uh, B plus tree is always better. <laughs> Tries are good, too, in some cases as well. Okay. All right. So, uh, so is this clear here? So, again, there was a bunch of optimizations you guys proposed, which I like. There are things you could do to make this better. Uh, for our purpose in this class, just assume that it's, it's the go down optimistically abort if, if you're wrong. Yes. 
see that for all these properties we're talking about, how effective they are depends on like depth versus like width of the of the nodes. Sure. Is there in practice a certain size, like certain magic numbers of bits that kind of work out better for things, or is or is there like some kind of ratio relative to like total value nodes you're gonna have, like if you like for instance if you nodes you're gonna have like I don't know n insertions and you try to have like everything be like at most so, so so his, his statement is there's this, uh, there's, there's an obvious trade off in the amount of concurrency we can have in our system uh, along two different dimensions, like the node width and then the height of the tree. Not just concurrency, all the, all the parent properties allowed, like um, lookup key, memory. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so all the, so not just concurrency, all the, fifth, all the different properties we care about in a B plus tree. I mean, I talked about the, the node size when we talked about the different hardware types, right? The answer is yes, but I don't, it's impossible to be able to say, you know, here's an, here's an exact formula for every single implementation and for all the different possible parameters you could have in your B plus tree and in, 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 in your system, what the right trade-off should be. Like, let's say, okay, in bus stuff, like, if I was to give this, like, let me know they don't actually go free, what would you, like, what's the test case for the size you know we're going to be having and what would be the magic number you would do it? For, okay, for, for this class, we were, there's a word about correctness, four kilobytes, whatever, whatever default is, is used that for simplicity. For, for, uh, it depends on the, the, the it depends on the, the the size of the key. Let's let's focus on credits. Uh, quick question, or because I, I want to get through scanning. So let's get back to the point here. Like uh, I was thinking, when you find that you just spit back, you want to restart your business on Mars. Um, but what if someone is picking in that get changed before you grab the right loss again? You don't need to grab the right loss again. So your so so your statement is. If I'm at if I'm if I'm at C, uh, I have the read latch, and then I get the right latch on this. But before I do, someone does something else. No, like once you realize that you go into the patch message way and then grab all the right locks all the way out, right? Yes. And then somebody go in before you, and then you you might insert say twenty six. Yes. And then you don't really need to do uh like play why you insert twenty five again. All right. So so his his statement is. What if I come through the first time, recognize that I'm going to have to split, I come back and do the pessimistic approach, but in that time, somebody else comes through and does an insert where now the, 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 the node I land on can absorb my right without having to do a split. So I could have done it the, the optimistic way. But how would I know that? Right? Do, like, as we said before, we don't want to pass messages. We can't pass messages between threads. That's too slow. Right? So... I don't know, but I don't care, right? Right loss is always safe, right? Uh, the right latch is always safe? What do you, like, what do you mind safe? Like, yeah, nobody can modify it, so that's fine, right? Again, I care about physical correctness. I care about, like, if I, my, or my pointer's gonna go nowhere, uh, or am, I, am, I, am, I, am I not gonna have false negatives, right? That's all I care about. If, if the path I come back the second time is completely different in the tree, who cares? Right? Yes? Uh, why don't we have a uh, right loss so we can batch the right? Uh, so, uh, so he said, why not have a right log so you can batch the rights? That's the B epsilon tree I said before, the, the, or fractal tree. You, there are approaches to do that. If a database knows it's running on single core, should it just use a single giant block? So the statement is, if a, uh, if a data system knows it's running on a single core, should I just use a giant, giant right latch for the whole thing? You can have multiple threads on a single core, right? Yeah, but it's just a single core, so. But I can have multiple threads. But wouldn't it be more efficient if you just have a giant right latch? One thread stalls because the page it needs is on disk. If that's my only thread, then I'm screwed, right? I want other threads to go, go do, do stuff. Now, SQLite has a single writer thread and then multiple reader threads, right? But even then, you still need to protect the latch, or just protect your data structure, because you could have you know, one reader thread and, and, and then the one, multiple reader threads in your data structure plus one writer thread. All right, let me get through scans, because you'll need this for, um, for project two. Right, so all the things we talked about so far have been pretty simple, because it's always top down. It's again, no deadlocks, all right? Because uh, everybody's going in the same direction. The original B plus tree did not have sibling pointers, and as I said, the B link tree 
uh, does have sibling pointers. If you don't have um, if you don't have sibling pointers, then the way you basically scan along leaf nodes is that you get to the bottom, get to the uh, you know, get to the end, recognize that because okay, I I I, I, th I think I need more things, and then you got to probe down again and land on the, on the next one, right? And each time you probe or traverse the tree, you're using the same protocols that we talked about before. But obviously, if you want to be able to scan along the leaf nodes, now we could potentially have deadlocks because I could be scanning this way and you could be scanning that way, right? So let's see a really simple example here, right? I want to find uh, all keys less than four. I, my thread stuff gets the, the read latch on A, uh, and then I just, just do the crabbing technique. I get down to C, take the read latch on that. And then now as I traverse along, uh, I'm not going to release the latch on C until I get the right latch, the, sorry, the read latch on B, because I don't want someone to change what the sibling pointer is while I'm jumping over, and then I, I land in nowhere. So, I, so it's sort of similar. I, I have to wait till I get to the next location before I, to, to the next sibling node before I release the latch, right? So once I have that, I can get over here and do whatever I want, and I'm done. Pretty simple. Let's bring in a writer, right? Two, sorry, two readers at the same time. So. One guy wants, thread wants to get all keys less than four. The other guy wants to get all keys less than one. They start at exactly the same time. Uh, they both get the read latch on node A. That's fine. Then they both get the, the read latch on their, or their corresponding leaf nodes. That's fine. But now when I want to go again, scan across, because this guy has the read latch on this, this guy has the read latch on that, those are commutative. So this is actually not a deadlock. Both T1 and T2 can hold the read latch on, on the corresponding nodes without any problems. So then they just swap places and then release the latch on whatever one they, they came from, right? That's easy. Okay, now let's bring in a writer. T1 wants to delete four, a single key, and T2 wants to find all keys greater than one, right? So at the very beginning, T2 is gonna get the read latch on node A uh, and get the read latch on B and go down. Uh, assuming we're doing optimistic latching, so the, so the T1 will get the read latch on A as well, then it gets the read latch on C, and then go ahead and release the, the read latch. So I get the right latch on C, and release the read latch on A. But now thread, thread 2 wants to traverse along the, the siblings uh, and now get the, uh, get the read latch on C, but it can't do that because thread 1 has the, the right latch on it, right? So what should happen here? What, 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 what could we do? Deadlock. I hear wait, I hear, I hear deadlock, abort. abort. Which one? No, so uh, abort who? Uh, uh, T2. He says abort T2. He says, why can't we just wait again? For how long? Right. right? So the, the correct answer is actually wait a little bit, but a very little bit, and then kill, uh, kill, T, uh, T, kill T2. I'm sorry, kill T1, right? I'm sorry, kill T2. T2 is red, right? Sorry, blue. We're killing the blue guy, sorry. All right, the reason we have to kill it is because we don't know anything about what the other threat is doing, right? Now, we know all they're doing is deleting one key, and they're not going to have to go in this direction. But at this point, there's nothing in our data structure that gives us that hint to know that he's not, you know, this other thread is not going to get this, this latch on here. So technically, there, there isn't really a deadlock, but we don't know that. Right? This would be a difference between locks and latches. In, in locks, there's a lock table that keeps track of who holds what locks and what locks they're waiting on. And we can make decisions, you know, is there a deadlock, and, and, and try to rectify things. And down in the threat in the latching world, we're trying to be as quick as possible. So if we can't get the latch, oftentimes it's just better to kill ourselves and then start back over. Right? Because the alternative is again maintaining a latch table about who holds what latch and how what they're gonna do for. But again, if I'm trying to be in and out in microseconds, it's gonna be more expensive to update the latch table than just you know delete myself or kill myself and start over. Yes. So, so his question is, uh, what if I had this scenario where I was doing delete and I needed to steal siblings from my, uh, 
from my, my guy over here, could I have a deadlock on this? In that case, you would hold the uh, you would hold a, a right latch on the on the on the parent, right? So either this guy is down here, uh, well, this so this guy down here. Uh, sorry, I need right latch on the parent. So either this guy got him before I did, uh, and as he scans along, he wouldn't get the right latch on this, and he would kill myself. Or I try to get the right latch on this, and I can't do that, and I kill myself. Yeah, I guess the nature of my question is, like, there are situations where you can actually deadlock if you don't kill yourself, right? Like, this, is no, this scenario is not a deadlock, but there are situations. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so same it is, it's correct. There are scenarios, this, is, this example here, there is not actually a deadlock, because they're not trying to go in different directions. I'm just trying to say that, like, you don't have to have a deadlock, but you, but you don't know that you don't have a deadlock, so it's better off to just kill yourself immediately. Yes? Is there a possibility of a raise condition here, depending on who acquires the latch on C first? The question is, is could there be a raise condition depending on who acquires the latch on C first? Uh, well, no, because if, if this guy, if T2 gets the read latch on this, then gets the read latch on this, this key can't get the right latch. So there, there, there isn't a raise condition. Right, but the output of this query finds the equation one would depend on. Okay, so his statement is. Uh, the 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 out or the result of the operation could change depending on who comes in first. Yes, that's a higher level concept for transactions. For our purposes here, we don't care about that. This is called phantoms. We'll cover them later. Yes. So the so so question is: In the example we talked about before, where I was trying to steal over here, and I, and, and I did have a deadlock, would they both have to kill themselves? Potentially, yes. She says, her question is, is there no way to pick one? How would you pick one? The ones on the right. The only one. But, the one who reads? Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the simple heuristic would be the one that, the, 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 the read one is cheaper, has probably done less work, so therefore, do, if, if I'm a read latch, uh, kill myself instead of the right latch, but the read latch doesn't know the other guy has a right latch, and the right latch doesn't know the guy has a read latch. Well, I mean, you would know that, but you, you wouldn't know... You wouldn't know what their intent is potentially on the, on the other side. So again, all this is, there's a bunch of different ways we can think about how to make this better, but in practice, we're trying to do this as fast as possible. So just like, just finish it, all right? Can you, can you potentially like maintain different timeouts for the left and right side so that you? Yeah, so her statement is, could you maintain different timeouts? Yes, and so this, this is a good example. So it, it may be the case uh, that the fine key is less than, less, greater than one, Maybe there's a bunch of nodes over here, and I, it took me you know, milliseconds to scan across, so I've done a ton of work. So at that point, maybe I want to be less trigger happy on myself, and maybe sleep a little bit longer. Yes, you could include how much work have I done so far to decide how aggressive you are about killing yourself. Yes? So in a situation where like, both um, threads have to like, uh, abort and restart, um, do you have any, like, are there concerns about uh, starvation or just like wasted cycles if like, yeah. they just so the statement is, if I'm just killing myself and restarting over and over again, could I end up doing a lot of wasted work? Absolutely, yes. It's unavoidable, yes. Yes? Um, so you said, if we want to steal something, then isn't it the case to also the right lock on the parent as well? So you're saying, if I, if I, if I want to, yeah, so if, if this guy needs to redistribute and steal from, from the sibling here, I need to hold the right latch on the parent, yes. Right. In my example, I didn't do that. Uh, you, would have to, you would have to hold a right latch on B as well, yes. Yes? So what if, like, the, uh, they both get aborted at the same time, and then they both get restarted at the same time, then it goes into the same situation? I mean, what's the likelihood of that happening, right? Like, like you're talking, like, within, like, nanoseconds, like, showing me the exact same time. It's, all right, so, so you, you, what you could do is, like, I mean, I'm not saying anybody does this, because I think it's unlikely this would happen, but you could say, okay, I've restarted four times, so let me sleep for, you know, 100 microseconds instead of, you know, 20 microseconds, right? You could do stuff like that. Okay. These are a lot of good optimizations. Um, so again, the main takeaway from all this is, like, we're not going to do any deadlock detection or avoidance, because uh, the latches don't support this, right? It's us as programmers, again, if you're, if you're in the data world, high paid, highly paid programmers, 
to write good code that doesn't have this problem. Right? This is why you don't let an average Joe Schmo JavaScript programmer work on your database system internals. You you uh, so you're in this class now. You're, you're at CMU, right? You're not an average JavaScript programmer. You guys are smarter than I am. You don't know it yet. By the time you figure it out, you graduate, and I look great. OK? What about If you go to Rehab? You say, what, you say, what about Rehab? No, I did not say anything. OK, sorry. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, so this is super hard to do. Obviously, you can imagine. We, this, we barely scratched the surface. I'll post a link about the latch tree data structure we build. It's even harder. And then so now, starting next class, we'll actually talk about how you do run queries. OK? All right, guys. See ya. Snakes.